Dear students, let's start with understanding the phases of corporate governance in India. Indian associations, corporate entities were bound by colonial guidelines and a large portion of the principles and guidelines took into account the impulses and likes of British employers. The Companies Act was enacted in 1866 and was amended in 1882, 1913 and 1932. Partnership Act was enacted in 1932. These enactments had a managing organization model as a focus as people, business firms went into a legitimate contract with business entities to manage the later. This period was an era of misuse, abuse of resources and shunning of obligations by managing specialists because of scattered and unprofessional proprietorship reforms in corporate governance. The first phase of India's corporate governance reforms 1996-2008. The primary or the first phase of India's corporate governance reforms were focused at making audit committees and boards more independent, focused and powerful supervisor of management and also of aiding shareholders including institution and foreign shareholders investors in supervising management. These reform efforts were channeled through a number of different parts with both the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, MCA, and the Securities Exchange Board of India, SEBI, playing important roles. According to commentators like Reid, the development of corporate governance in India can be understood as a transition across three distinct models of governance, namely, the managing agent model, the business house model, and finally the Anglo-American model, read 2002. The last two era of special concern to us. Reed proceeds to explain that the business house model was largely a creation of the Nehruvian welfare state, where capitalism was tightly regulated, read 2002. As Chakravarti et al. 2007 stated, the turn towards socialism in the decades after independence marked by 1951 Industries Development and Regulation Act and 1956 Industrial Policy Revolution put in place a regime and a culture of licensing, protection and widespread red tape that bred corruption and stilted the growth of the corporate sector. The situation worsened in subsequent decades and corruption, nepotism and inefficiency became the hallmark of Indian corporate sector. This gave rise to the class called promoters who used their proximity to power center to obtain license for new industries. The primary function of the promoter was to float new ventures by contributing a minimum of equity capital and then raising the rest through public offering or from public financial institutions, PFIs. Read 2002, page 253. Promoters tended to start several unrelated ventures and thereby gain control of a number of firms. This gave rise to so-called business houses, where members of a single family held control interest in an array of unrelated concerns. Read 2002. 
Such arrangements entailed several consequences. One of these, as Reed noted, was that in corporations and presumably business houses as well, small shareholders and their interests were often marginalized mostly due to the considerable power wielded by the business families that owned them. Refer to Reed 2002, page 256. Gola Kota and Gupta pointed to a disconnect between equity ownership and actual control that also prevailed widely, mainly due to nationalized financial institutions, which owned considerable amount of equity, not exercising the levels of control that they were entitled to. This was because such institutions were not held accountable for the profitability of the investment they made, which gave them little incentive to actively participate in the day-to-day -day affair of the companies they invested in. Gola Kota and Gupta, 2006. The stringent regulations mentioned earlier began to be dismantled in the 1990s through a set of reforms collectively referred to as liberalization. Changes made to the corporate legal regime included augmenting disclosure norms, establishing a national advisory committee on accounting standards, and so forth. Read 2002. Indeed, much of the corporate governance reforms we talk about owe their origin to this period. Such incentives being the result of the recommendation stemming from several committee reports as stated below. First is Birla Committee 1999. A committee was set up by Securities and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, under the chairmanship of one of the members of the SEBI board, Kumar Mangalam Birla, in 1999, to advance and raise the norms of corporate governance. The committee was framed with the primary objective to view corporate governance from the perspective of the investors and the shareholders, and thereby prepare a code that would fit into the Indian corporate regime. The report proceeds on the assumption that shareholders ought to be treated as proprietors of the company. And hence, in such capacity, they have certain rights and obligations. Be that at, as it may, in actually, company cannot be overseen by shareholder choice alone, and shareholders are not anticipated to accept accountability for the administration of corporate issues including compliances and decision making. A company's administration must have the capacity to make business decisions in an expedited fashion. This necessitates the shareholders to essentially delegate a significant number of their obligations as proprietors of the company to the directors, who then get into be in de facto charge of corporate procedure and cooperation. This implementation of this methodology is usually carried out by a specialist management team. This relationship requires the board and the administration to be ultimately responsible and accountable to the shareholders of the company. A decent corporate structure is one that gives sufficient opportunity to the shareholders for powerful commitment in the administration of the company, while demanding an exclusive requirement of corporate conduct without getting involved in the everyday working of the company. Birla Committee Report 2017, Para 14.1. The bulk of the report consists of certain mandatory and recommendatory provisions stretched across various paragraphs, paragraph 14.5 to 14.16, not only deal with the rights of shareholders in detail, but also mention about the institution shareholders. Paragraph 14.5 mentions the basic rights of the shareholders that is inclusive of the right to transfer and registration of shares obtaining relevant information about the company on a timely and regular basis, participating and voting in shareholders meetings, electing members of board, and sharing in the residual profits of the company. Para 14.6 subsequently provides the shareholders with a right to be supplied 
with information with respect to decision relating to material changes such as takeover, sale of assets or divisions of the company and changes in capital structure that may lead to shift in control or may result in certain shareholders obtaining control disproportionate to the equity ownership. The report states an organization must have a suitable frameworks set up which will empower the investors to take an interest in the corporate activity successfully and vote in the investors meeting. The organization ought to likewise keep the investors educated of the guidelines and voting techniques which administer the general investor meetings. As indicated by the paragraph 14.10 of the report, the annual general meeting of the organization ought not ever be purposely held in a manner that would render it difficult for most of the investors to participate in. The organization should likewise guarantee that the voting process is not so arranged as to make it difficult or expensive for the investors to make their choice. The report goes on to recommend in paragraph 14.11 providing the postal ballots for key decisions to shareholders who are unable to attend the meetings with a detailed list of matters which should require the postal ballot being laid down in annexure 3 of the report. Under paragraph 14.12, the committee put forth a mandatory recommendation that a board committee under the chairmanship of a non-executive director should be formed to specifically look into the redressing of shareholder complaints like transfer of share, non-receipt of balance sheet, non-receipt of declared dividend, etc. Such a suggestion was given as it was believed that the formation of such a committee will help focus the attention of the company on shareholders grievances and sensitize the management to address the same in an expedited manner. Paragraph 14.13 lays down a mandatory recommendation that to expedite the process of share transfers, the board of the company should delegate the power of share transfer to an officer or a committee or to the registrar and share transfer agents with such delegated authority attending to share transfer formalities at least once in a fortnight. Naresh Chandra Committee 2002 The Department of Company Affairs set up on 21st August 2002 the Naresh Chandra Committee to examine various issues related to corporate governance. Given the limited attention paid by the committee to the aspects of shareholder rights and allied issues, the report submitted by it is of mere peripheral significance and the context of this paper. The relevance that it does bear stems from paragraph 2.5 of the report which later Narayana Murthy committee report referred to and used as a basis of its subsequent recommendations on shareholders rights. The said paragraph specifically addresses the issue of disclosure of contingent liabilities and proposes that the management ought to give a clear description in plain English language of every material contingent liability and its risks. Further, this ought to be supplemented by the auditor's clearly worded comments on such views as expressed by the administration. The segment ought to be highlighted in the significant accounting policies and notes on accounts as well as in the auditor's report wheresoever deemed essential. This is critical in the light of the fact that investors and shareholders ought to get a clear and accurate picture of an organization's contingent liabilities as these might be noteworthy risk figures that could unfavorably influence the company's future monetary condition and after effects of operations. Narayana Murthy Committee 2003 Under the chairmanship of N. R. Narayana Murthy, the chairman and chief mentor of Infosys Technologies Limited, SEBI subsequently constituted a committee to assess the prevailing corporate governance norms and to enhance and strengthen 
such practices in keeping with the advancement of the market economy as a whole. The committee met thrice on 7 December 2002, 7 Jan 2003 and 8 Feb 2003 to discuss the issues related to corporate governance and eventually presented its recommendation to SEBI. The terms of reference of the committee are set out as under. To audit execution of corporate governance and to decide the part of the companies in reacting to talk and other value sensitive data flowing the market so as to upgrade the integrity and transparency of the market. The right of the shareholders have been dealt by the committee under various heads. Under risk management mentioned in part 3.5 of the committee's report, reference has been made to board disclosures with the committee emphasizing the importance for the board to be completely mindful of the dangers confronting the business as well as the investors to think about the procedure by which the company chooses to deal with the various obstacles on its path. In this context, the committee did look into another useful concept namely nominee directors, excluding them in part 3.8 of the report from the ambit of the definition of independent directors. The committee felt that the institution of nominee directors presents a situation that sound corporate governance practices ought to maintain a strategic distance from. Such director regularly assert that they are liable just to shareholders who have nominated them and assume no liability for the organization's administration or trustee obligation to different investors. It is vital that all executives in the case of speaking to organizations or something else ought to have similar duties and liabilities. The report also states that in case of appointment of nominees on the board, the normal process of election by shareholder must be adopted. SEBI.gov 2003. As a mandatory recommendation, the report suggests that there may be no one chosen nominee, rather where a foundation wishes to choose a directors on the board, such arrangements ought to be made by the investors. An institutional executive so selected should have similar obligations and might be liable to indistinguishable liabilities from some other director. Nominee of the government on public sector companies ought to be similarly elected and subjected to the same responsibilities and liabilities as other directors. Further, the report recommends that all the compensation made to the non-executive directors should be approved by the shareholders and may be fixed by the board of directors. JJ Irani Expert Committee 2005. Last but not the least come the turn of a committee that had been constituted under the chairmanship of JJ Irani, director of Tata Sons on 2nd December 2004 with the task of suggesting to the government the proposed changes to the Companies Act 1956. The right of the shareholders have been scattered across various parts in the report submitted by this committee. While discussing the shifting of registered offices of the company, which required such shift taking place from one state to another to be subject to the order of the company law board, the committee expressed its concern at the delay and the cost involved in the process. The view was communicated that this choice ought to be left to the shareholders. In any case, committee additionally perceived that interest of the stakeholders ought to be made a key consideration for the process, which in turn should be rendered on an urgent basis, less complex, speedier and less demanding without reference to a tribunal court, thus guaranteeing that the new registered office is available to take stakeholders for legitimate plans of action as when and where required. JJ Irani Committee Report 2017 page 17. With regard to contentious issues such as manner of appointment, removal and resignation of directors, it was expressed 
that the ultimate decision to appoint remove directors ought to be that of the company, in other words that of the shareholders. On the off chance that the director themselves are legitimately precluded to hold directorship, they ought to have an equivalent duty regarding unveiling the reality and purposes behind their exclusion. Government ought not to mediate during the process of appointment and removal of directors in non-government companies. It was deemed essential that the powers of the government under the laws in vogue to intercede in the appointment of directors be reviewed and revised, vesting the responsibilities on the shareholders instead. In the case of director's remuneration, the committee again felt that the issue had to be decided by the shareholders in the light of the prevailing circumstances within the company, including but not limited to its financial health. To enable proper decision making in this regard, it was important to subject this aspect to a strong corporate governance mechanism on the basis of accurate and transparent disclosures. Therefore, the committee felt that this decision need not to be taken by the government on behalf of the company, but should be left on its shareholders whose approval should necessarily be taken. J.J. Irani Committee Report 2017, page 27. Regarding disclosure requirements, as the shareholders in case of a scheme of merger acquisition need to have complete data, particularly in relation to merger proposed by the promoters. The Act rules ought to mandate providing explicit necessary disclosure requirements in the explanatory statement to be sent to the shareholders with regard to the plan documented under the watchful eye of the court tribunal. J.J. Irani Report 2017, page 79. The committee also acknowledged the additional need for administration of punishments comparable with the offence under the provisions of the Companies Act. Activities disregarding governance provisions in a way that deny the shareholders their right should be dealt with seriously. The committee was of the view that the fraudulent conduct ought to be subjected to the stringent punishment as should be deficient wrong or false disclosure or activities that do not permit shareholders democracy or a focused market for corporate control to work. On the other hand, infringement of a procedural sort that does not irreversibly harm stakeholders' rights should be dealt with in a different way as per the committee's suggestions. J.J. Irani Committee Report, 2017, page 85. Finally, while discussing the subject of lifting of the corporate wheel, the committee opened that under certain circumstances, notwithstanding the provisions of the company, law firm putting the associated responsibility and the risk on the board and the officers in default. It might still be possible for the promoters of controlling interests to act in derogation of the spirit of the law while adhering to its letter. Where fraudulent action has been discovered regardless of the statutory prohibitions, the law ought to accommodate lifting the corporate wheel to identify such promoters or shareholders who are the later ego behind the corporate behemoth and determine whether they can be held liable for said action and if so, to what extent. As the committee suggested, there ought to be a framework of punishment and sanctions laid down for catering to such situations. J.J. Irani Committee Report, 2017, page 91. While the report submitted by all the aforementioned committees did play a significant role in the evolution of corporate governance within the Indian legal sector, but no means was such evolution confined only within the recommendation made by such report and the treatment meted out them by the government. Second stage of corporate governance after Satyam scheme. India's corporate community experienced a significant shock in January 2009 with damaging revelations about board failure and the colossal fraud in the financials of Satyam. The Satyam scandal also served as a catalyst for the Indian government to rethink the corporate governance, disclosure, accountability and enforcement mechanism in place. 
Industry response shortly after the news of this scandal broke, the CII became examining the corporate governance issues arising out of the Satyam scandal. Other industry groups also formed corporate governance and ethics committees to study the impact and lessons of this scandal. In late 2009, a CII task force put forth corporate governance reform recommendations. In its report, the CII emphasized the unique nature of the Satyam scandal, noting that Satyam is one-off incident. This overwhelming majority of the corporate India is well-run, well-regulated and does business in a sound and legal manner. In addition to the CII, the National Association of Software and Services Companies, NASCOM, self-described as the premier trade body and the chamber of the commerce of the IT BPO industries in India. Also formed a corporate governance and ethics committee chaired by N. R. Narayana Murthy, one of the founders of Infosys and leading figure in Indian corporate governance reforms. The committee issued its recommendation in mid-2010. This was all for today. Hope you have understood. So we will meet in the third part of the corporate governance. Till then, take care and goodbye.